The man that I will introduce to you today has many accomplishments, which I will get to, but I would like you to hear first a little bit about the historical associations of Mr. Arthur Amiot with the Buffalo Bill Center of the West. I'm sure he'll be covering this today, but Arthur's family history with the center goes back much farther than you may think, as he is the great-grandson of Standing Bear, a Lakota performer in the Buffalo Bill Wild West show. And Standing Bear would tour until 1890 when he was injured in Vienna and he was left behind to recover. His eventual return to Pine Ridge was with his Viennese nurse, who would then become his wife, and her name was Louise. And the family lineage continued some generations later with a young Arthur Amiot. And by the strange twist of fate, and maybe this was also a little bit of a spiritual nudge from the spirit of Standing Bear, Arthur became a founding member of the Plains Indian Museum Advisory Board when he was a wee bit younger back in 1976. And now for his accolades. Well, really, I, I started looking at, at his accomplishment and thought, well, what hasn't he done? He has spent a lifetime sharing his philosophy, his visions, his cultural knowledge of Lakota life. And I didn't feel it was appropriate or necessary to edit such wonderful life achie achievements. I'm sure I may have missed a few things, too. So please make yourself comfortable and prepare for an earful. In addition to being a recognized Oglala Lakota artist, Arthur Amiot is a scholar, he is an educator, he's an art historian, and he's an author. Arthur served on the Indian Advisory Committee to the architect designer for the National Museum of the American Indian in Washington, D.C., the commission for establishing the Indian Memorial at the Little Bighorn Battle site, the Presidential Advisory Council for the Performing Arts at the Kennedy Center, the Board of Directors for the Native American Art Studies Association, the U.S. Department of the Interior's Indian Arts and Crafts Board, and the Council of Regents of the Institute of American Indian Arts. As an artist, he's had extensive group and solo exhibitions. He received three honorary doctorates, and in 2002 was awarded a Bush Foundation Artist Scholarship, and in 2010, the Bush Foundation Enduring Vision Award. He's a graduate of Northern State University in Aberdeen, South Dakota, and he received a Master's of Interdisciplinary Studies in Anthropology, Religion, and Arts from the University of Montana, Missoula. And in June, we were most pleased to honor Arthur with the Spirit of the American West Award here at the Center for his contributions as a founding advisor. He is an author of many publications with contributions to exhibition catalogs, including the Nelson Atkins Museum's Plains Indian Artist of Earth and Sky, and closer to us here at the Center, Arthur also contributed to the book Memory and Vision, Arts, Cultures, and Lives of Plains Indian People, published by the University of Washington Press in 2007, and he recently wrote the introduction for an upcoming publication titled Plains Indian Buffalo Cultures, Art from the Paul Dyke Collection, which is authored by curator Emerita Emma Hansen, and you will see that in May of 2018. His most recent solo exhibition, Transformation and Continuity in Lakota Culture, The Collages of Arthur Amiot, 1988 to 2014, was featured at the Akta Lakota Museum and Cultural Center as well as the Dolls Art Center in Rapid City. And I'd like to note that Arthur will be doing a book signing for this catalog today at 2 to 2.30, and that will be in front of the museum store. So please be sure to get a copy of the catalog and have Arthur sign it. It's a wonderful publication. His art is featured in the center's collections. It's sought out by private and museum collectors, not just around the nation, but globally. And these are visual dialogues between multiple worlds that really span the barriers of both time and cultures. And Arthur has stuck with us through all of this to provide unparalleled vision and wisdom during the building of a brand new Plains Indian Museum way back in 1979, but also an inspiring reinstallation of the same museum in 2000. 
he worked tirelessly on the recreation of his great-grandfather's cabin in the adversity and renewal section in the gallery. If you have not visited that, please do, because it's a timeless installation brought to life by Arthur's voice and his memories. His knowledge is encyclopedic, but it is really his willingness to spend a lifetime sharing this knowledge that makes him so very special. Although it is now 41 years later, his mind is of the sharpest quality, his voice is strong, and I must say he has a wonderful head of hair <laughs> and a marvelous sense of humor. He is a friend, he is a mentor, and I am honored to welcome Arthur Amiot. Thank you very much, uh, Rebecca. And I want to thank Jeremy and all of his staff and all the way from the person who roams around in the uh, storage units to the very top of the director's office. All of them, I think, are uh, ought to be congratulated on this magnificent uh, occasion for the uh, for this symposium. And of course, all of you scholars uh, deserve, of course, the greatest accolades because this is, this is your arena, this is your place for exposition of your life work, your ideas, your minds, and your dedication. I pay homage to you today. And of course, it would not be complete if you didn't have someone to talk to. So I, did, I, I want to thank all the guests and interested citizens and additional scholars who have come to this event. Uh, after 40 years of being a, a board member, I see this as another accomplishment of this magnificent institution. Uh, However, uh, time does take its toll, and I do feel like the very old chicken that crossed the road, and <laughs> once it got there, it says, now, why, why is it that I just crossed this road, <laughs> you know? <laughs> However, my subject is also, uh, there's an egg metaphor uh, again. <laughs> it has to do with which came first, the chicken or the egg, because the subject that I want to discuss with you is, is a very complex one, because the essence of its message occurred long, long, long before I was born, and it passed through the sieve of the oral tradition out of which, through which it was strained and parts were left out, parts were forgotten, parts were diminished, and it was not until I reached an age of reason with a modicum of education that I had to go back and rediscover. Of course, that's what historians do, but I'm not a historian. I'm a member of a, of a very strange uh, uh, and exotic family, <laughs> and uh, piecing it all together again is uh, has been something of a task. <coughs> but I dare say this institution and my appointment to it as a board member in 1976 had a profound effect upon me, because once I got here and discovered it. I already knew about my family's uh, association with, with buf the Buffalo Bill experience. And to discover a place uh, that had archives, that had objects, it brought together, uh, uh, it created an impetus for me to want to pursue this. Kind of like uh, that 
Mormon Mormon guy when he saw the valley in Utah, you know, he said, this is the place, you know? <laughs> and I, uh, I it, something like that happened to me. It was an epiphany that I knew this was going to be the place that I wanted to spend a lot of time and, and to try to do as much as I could because I'd spent the first half of my life acquiring education that would enable me to function institutionally. And it also gave me a perspective on the use of scholarly uh, methods and approaches and how to, to manage the, the, the materials that I thought was here because I found out there were some things here that did not exist that I <laughs> thought I was going to learn a hell of a lot from. But over the years, over the years, there has been an accrual of, of additional material. And most certainly at this time, the great contributions that all of you as scholars and curators have made to the field, uh, particularly this most recent book on Lakota performers. Uh, I look forward to delving into that because that's uh, essentially uh, what my presentation uh, is centered around uh, this, this, af this afternoon. And so coupled with desire and uh, intellect that you, that you have and with which you have brought to further elucidation, the remarkable elements of the <laughs> Buffalo Bill story, uh, it has been good anyway. Uh, this old chicken knows why he crossed that road. <laughs> <you know>? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but to, to, to begin with, um, the gentleman that you see here in a business suit is my great-grandfather. His name was Standing Bear, and I must say that he is not related in any way to Luther Standing Bear, nor Henry Standing Bear, nor to the Ponca Standing Bear, <laughs> nor is he related to the Standing Bear that uh, in 1991 uh, went, uh, was sent abroad along with Short Bull. Uh, I mean, that, that Standing Bear was one of the uh, uh, wounded knee, as you, what would you say, militants? Anyway, he was sent abroad uh, along with uh, Kicking Bear and, and Short Bull to show them the broader world and give them a vision of how uh, futile their efforts were. And uh, now that standing bear did a goodly number of things, and, uh, uh, but, but, they, they, but they, were, uh, he's not, they are not to be confused with this standing bear. Now this standing bear actually went by the name, he received his name in the very traditional fashion he returned from a horse capturing expedition against the Crows uh, between 1859 and 1876 as he was growing into a young man. And he was badly injured at that time. So somehow injuries uh, are significant for this man <laughs> because he was brought back to life by his uncle who was a bear medicine man. And in the tradition of healing, uh, should you uh, uh, recover, then you are somewhat inducted into that, uh, that realm of those practitioners. And so it was during the, the recovery that, that uh, in a state of delirium, uh, upon the, with the rattles and the drums and the, and the doctoring, that he had the vision of a giant bear standing up and embracing him and healing him, and hence the name Standing Bear. He did not take a Christian name. Oh, he was born in 1859, and he lived until 1933. He did not take a Christian name until 1932 at the begging of his daughters who thought that he should be baptized just in case, you know. <laughs> and uh, uh, so he was given the Christian name Stephen so that he could have a proper death certificate. <laughs> uh, 
uh, but all through the uh, all through his life and through the travels with the Wild West show, he was simply known as Standing Bear. And on the um, uh, on the uh, placemat that was uh, that survived or was given out during the 1887 campaign in England, there is a list of all the performers. And, uh, and his name appears on there as Standing Bear. So does Black Elk. And uh, then, of course, you know, they didn't have members of other tribes. So the Sioux that were with that, uh, and it's been talked about today already. I'm talking about the 87, 88 show in England. Um, some of them uh, played the roles of Cheyenne and Arapaho and, and so the, on this little uh, printout uh, we see the shot we see black elk appearing as Sue and then we see another black elk appearing as Cheyenne and so forth anyway it's a, a nice little document which I got from these archives here but it, at that time that was one of the few vestiges <laughs> Of who the who the Indians were that had traveled with this expedition. Anyway, stand my standing bear, of course, was much better behaved than Black Elk. <laughs> and uh, of course, Bla and I must tell you, um, he 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 has remained a con uh, an obscure figure. He first came to light uh, during after the publication of the, the John Nyhar book, Black Elk Speaks, because that, that uh, tome, uh, that book, was written in the same community that I grew up in and which was uh, the home of Black Elk and Standing Bear and Rocky Bear and Red Shirt. And uh, they were members of the Crazy Horse Band. They were present when Crazy Horse surrendered in 1877 at Fort Robinson. Their names appear on the Crazy Horse ledger book. And the Crazy Horse band, as you know, was, was called Oyukpe. And o the Lakota word Oyukpe means to draw down. And, and because of Crazy Horse's charisma and his personality, he was able to pull down members from other Lakota bands. <laughs> and so great-grandfather was a mini koju. And, there, and then there were hunk papas, and, and there were brulees, and there were numerous. Anyway, Crazy Horse's band was made of, of these different tribal members. And so there were slightly different traditions anyway. Once the reservation was established at, uh, at, P at the Pine Ridge Agency, uh, Crazy Horse's band moved away. They didn't get along with Red Cloud. They, they, they were not Red Cloud people. They, they were Crazy Horse people. Anyway, they divided into two sub-bands, and one went to the eastern side of the reservation, and one went to the Manderson, to the Manderson community where I, where I grew up on the Pine Ridge Reservation. And it was populated by Standing Bear, Black Elk, Rocky Bear, and all those people who that you read about if you read about the Wild West show. And um, and so it is that uh, that Standing Bear uh, eventually uh, be by 1930, 31, 32, when Nyhart was there, he had become the leader of the community. And so it was that when Nyhart was, uh, was interviewing Black Elk, it was established that he tell his great vision uh, in front of the authorities. And because Standing Bear was the chief of the community, that interview where Black Elk reveals his great vision was done in the presence of Standing Bear to make sure that Black Elk didn't tell any lies, <coughs> and uh, and the son Benjamin as the as the interpreter. Okay, so the the story of Standing Bear. We'll we'll we'll, we'll go back to the big chicken before the egg. Um, he fought at the Battle of the Little Bighorn at the age of of, of seventeen, and. Uh, 
uh, once again traveled with Crazy Horse's van to Fort Robinson and relocated to, to the, uh, eventually to the Manderson community on the Pine Ridge Reservation. And in 1887, as a young man of probably thir 30 or so, he, he went with the Wild West show to, to, to England. And unlike Black Elk, he did not stay behind. But some of the stories that, I, that were passed through, passed through two generations, actually just one generation. My grandmother was the first <laughs> of his ch children to be born on the reservation. <laughs> and so my, my, my mother and uncles were the first to hear the stories. And eventually uh, uh, they uh, experienced the, the life of his Austrian wife and, and the stories continued. And, but I uh, uh, just, I, I marvel at the fact that I was born in the last half of the first half of the last century, <laughs> which is 1942. <laughs> and and my, my grandmother was born, and uh, she had two sisters. One was born in 1892, one in 1895, and she was born in 1897. And she lived until 1985 and raised four generations in her home after her, after her father died in 19 father and mother died in 1933. Anyway, when I talk, I'm saying this because it's the passage of stories that have preserved, as it were, my knowledge of Standing Bear having traveled with the Wild West show. You know, the, 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 the storytelling tradition, and some of you may have ex experienced it in your yeah, as you were growing up, but the evenings there were no radios and TVs, and uh, after the lamps were turned down low, uh, the household all in their little beds, you know, it was the role of the grandfather and the grandmother to tell stories, and the stories they told ranged all the way from the origin stories, the sacred origin stories of, 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 of the tribe, how the world came to be, how it was created, how the mountains were created, and the great trickster, Iktomi, the changing one, how he could change into other beings and he was perpetually tormenting human beings and he, was, he, was, uh, he could uh, change himself from one being into another being or he could be part human, he could be part animal, Anyway, after many years, I, um, uh, he, he was a horrible character, and as you grew up, if you were being naughty, you know, or sly, or uh, uh, incalcitrant, you know, they said, now don't be like Ikdomi, you know, you don't want to be like that person. Huh? But in his changeling character, and the analysis of what a trickster means to most cultures, you know, you eventually come to the understanding that Iktomi represents, you know, the, the, the growing consciousness of conscience because you suddenly learn that the, the, if you behave like Iktomi, you're being adverse to the culture. And so you, you try to emulate good behavior and, and to be a good person. And uh, anyway, so the... Uh, uh, the Benjamin Black Elk, uh, Nicholas Black Elk's son was talking to me one time. He said, you know, Iktomi still lives in all of us. We're all Iktomi. And our, I, our whole task, you know, is to get away from him. Don't be like him, you know. <laughs> and uh, uh, however, I see uh, when, when I was growing up, I asked my grandmother, she'd be telling stories, uh, because she was part Viennese, she would tell stories from Grimm's fairy tales. I mean, she, she, her, her mother was Austrian, huh? <laughs> and she, they grew up on hearing European uh, uh, mythology. Uh, in fact, in the old bookcase, there was a, a book of Grimm fairy tales, and they wouldn't allow us to look at it because the illustrations were so gruesome. And there was also a book 
uh, I, I'm sure it was Dante's Inferno. And we were never to look at that book because that, that, that was hell. And I said, I said, well, Grandma, did Iktomi, did Iktomi live over there in Europe too? And she said, oh, he probably did, you know. And I think we're, we're all convinced now that he also lives in Washington, D.C. <laughs> <laughs> I just don't know what the chances are of changing him. <laughs> <laughs> However, be that as it may, <laughs> the, uh, the, the story of Standing Bear, once again, uh, is, is remarkable because he went through the entire episode uh, of the travels from Oh, uh, after Paris, you know, the show, the in, oh, then he joined in 1889 and attended the Paris Exposition in, in, and, and continued there. And uh, a recent uh, work by Peter Hazrick talks about the Rocky Bear and Oglala, a performer with the Wild West show, encountering the painting, The Last of the Buffalo, in the front window of the Boussard Valadancy Gallery in Paris, Hazrick quotes Rocky Bear as saying that upon his return to the United States, he planned to make all the children of his tribe to look upon the great man Birdstadt, who has given breath and life to the glorious past of the redskin and to the buffalo when the Indian was the master of all he could survey. You know. <laughs> anyway, the uh, so Standing Bear. Uh, could have been there. I know we heard stories about him traveling, uh, going up to the top of the Eiffel Tower and seeing the world from that perspective, and how how he and Red Shirt uh, uh, and and others. And then there are stories by those who went after that. Those become incorporated as a part of the stories about Europe. And anyway, the one the uh, one one story about uh, red shirt, and then sometimes they switch it to iron tail. Anyway, they're standing below the Eiffel Tower. This is 1889, or another year, whatever. 1889. Anyway, the uh, uh, the people are coming around, and they they want to take pictures of the of the Indians, you know. And and that day they say, well, where's where's Red shirt, where's red shirt? We want a photograph of red shirt. And Rocky Bear tells the interpreter, he's not here right now. He's riding the carousel. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and we'll, we'll, we'll see something about that a little bit later. <laughs> anyway, so, so the, the, these wonderful stories were passed down once again through the oral tradition. But once again, thanks to all of you in further expo exposition, exposing all these other stories that was going on at the time, I, as a bicultural person, have been able to try to fill out the picture, you know. <laughs> and, uh, 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 but however, uh, the, I want to uh, go through some photographs here to show you. Oh, there is Louise, taken in, the picture was taken in Dresden, Dresden, when she was either 16 or 18 years old, she was uh, she was the uh, daughter of a retired military officer. Her uncle was a surgeon, and she was his assistant. And she spoke German, English, and French, and of course had a command of Latin because she was uh, a, med a medical assistant to her uncle. <laughs> she was his nurse. And it was at, and if you look at, if you know how to read Victorian photographs, you know that it was standard if you were wished to portray that you were an educated person, that you also included the book. Huh? <laughs> See the book, her hand on the book. And if you were a very social conscious person at that time and you wanted a photograph of yourself as an educated person, you had a book there, and you were pointing to the book that you knew how to read and that you were accomplished in, in that realm. 
And anyway, so she, uh, he was injured. He'd been through, uh, been to uh, Lyon and Marseille, Barcelona, Naples, Rome, Florence, Bologna, Milan, Venice, Munich, and it was in Vienna where he was injured and had to stay behind for five months. And uh, Cody left his ticket and some money for him at the U.S. consulate or embassy, whatever it was. And uh, so he uh, lived with them for five months, and then he got news that his young wife and baby daughter were murdered at Wounded Knee on December 29th. 1890, and uh, so uh, it must in 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 February of that the next of 91. Then uh, five or six weeks later, then he and his nurse, who became they got married there, and and her family also immigrated, along with two uh, daughters. Because I believe that I believe now that she was a young widow, <laughs> and I believe those young girls were hers. And uh, they immigrated to the United States, returned to the, li the, the Re Pine Ridge Reservation, and her parents, of course, could not bear living there because it was illegal to drink beer or wine, <laughs> and so they moved to Chicago, and they uh, became prosperous in dry goods. He opened a dry goods business. And, uh, and Louise re uh, remained on the reservation. And they created uh, a hybrid life. And uh, initially, their first house looked something like this. It was a tiny cabin. This is the way the cabins looked in the early days of the reservation. But eventually, through her entrepreneurial spirit, they built a fine a uh, log house with a frame roof and glass windows and a wooden floor and a wooden ceiling. And uh, grafting their talents to each other, she knew animal husbandry and, and horticulture and land management. And uh, believe me, she was a, a, a force to be contended with. The early days of, of allotment, Indian people were just they put names in hats and pulled them out in terms of the location of the land that they were going to be allotted. And he was initially given a very poor piece of land two, all, two, <laughs> two, two miles away from a river. And um, um, Louise, of course, being, you know, one of those German entrepreneurial bossy persons. She took on the government and went and um, insisted on seeing the maps and, and, she, and, her, and his relatives gave her a tour of the reservation and she picked out a prime piece of land with a spring that just flowed. In fact, it continued to flow all through the 30s and it's still flowing today, you know, freshwater spring. There was a creek that ran through that gave rise to fine meadows. Anyway, they had, they had uh, milk cows and they had cattle that ran in the, uh, uh, in the pastures in, in, in the winter t in summertime. They drove them up on the red shirt table and red shirt and his relatives, he was a cousin of Standing Bear, they grazed up on the top of the, uh, the buttes of, of uh, near the Badlands and then the, um, uh, in the fall, Standing Bear and the community at Pine Ridge would go up onto Raj in a wagon train and butcher and, and store up uh, uh, dried meat for the winter with, uh, and share it with all the people who took care of their cattle during the summer. In other words, he became the chief of his community and in doing so, uh, distributed, uh, uh, his role was to redistribute the food to his community huh? uh, in terms of the old status system of, of sharing one's, one's uh, uh, bounty. Uh, and, uh, of course, it would not have been possible had Louise not been the, 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 the businesswoman that she was. She also made sure that all the inherited land, because Standing Bear had relatives in Montana, at the Standing Rock Reservation, on the Rosebud Reservation, the Lower Brule Reservation, 
Uh, he inherited allotments from all of those relatives and she kept track of that. And indeed, in the 1950s, when oil was produced on the Montana allotments, uh, the family was, was quite prosperous, <laughs> you know. And uh, anyway, she managed all of those affairs. And uh, uh, they, they had, uh, oh, here they are. Here, here they, uh, Louise and Standing Bear on the right-hand side. This is my biological grandmother wearing her beaded dress. The young man with the baby is her first husband. Her husband's kept dying from disease, so she was married three times and had sets of children from each. Anyway, this is, as Vine Deloria would say, this is a, uh, a very typical Lakota family of that period. There's a grandmother, a grandfather, a mother, a father, a baby, and either a missionary or an anthropologist. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, uh, be, because, because Louise spoke uh, German and English and Lakota, she, she did learn the, she began learning the language back in Vienna and continued to learn it because that was one of the prerequisites. If she was going to be a Lakota wife in a Lakota household, she was, to, to be truly a Lakota, she had to uh, uh, speak the language, and she did. She wanted to, she did. And, uh, and so she became something of an interpreter, albeit her daughters were sometimes criticized when they were youngsters attending the local day school or the local convent school, and uh, they were uh, criticized by their age mates uh, who knew Lakota, and they would speak Lakota to each other. And, but those Standing Bear girls, they, they, they spoke Lakota with a German accent, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but, but that didn't pass on to, to their children because, the <laughs> but Standing Bear insisted that uh, the Lakota language be spoken in the home as the first language. Uh, however, uh, and, and, and Louise never taught German to anybody, but she did speak English because that was the, the language of the school. And so it was that the, the household prospered, and the daughters were, were, grew to maturity and married uh, 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 other, uh, grand, this, this husband, grandmother's first husband was a full blood. But coming after that, the, the daughters all married mixed bloods, which was the, uh, the uh, somewhat of the tradition. If you were of that class of people and they recognized that they were <laughs> mixed bloods, they were half-breeds, uh, that it was appropriate for them to, to marry other mixed bloods or other half-breeds. Uh, and so that's the way it happened. And each time, uh, all the time that the daughters, each time they married, uh, the, the parents set them up with a new log house and a new stove and new beds and, and heads of cattle. In other words, they endowed their, their daughters with, uh, with a, a fine dowry huh, of, of household goods. And each of the daughters had ten children. And uh, anyway, that came in light of the, 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 t uh, the 1900 census, national census, the, na the official national census in, in 1900 revealed that there were, and this is all over the United States, that there were only 250,000 Indian people left. And I'm of the mind that, of course, some of them weren't counted. <laughs> but on the other hand, that's what, and uh, the traditional Lakota family was four. And uh, Standing Bear and Louise had three daughters and one son, but the son died in infancy. Uh, but in light of the, in light of the, uh, the dying population, uh, they encouraged their daughters to have children. And in fact, one of the interviews done of Standing Bear about the Battle of the Little Bighorn, uh, he makes the statement, we thought the reason we fought the way we did at the Little Bighorn is because we thought if we were wiped out, there would be no more Indian people in the country. <laughs> and so they, they got the message once they found out about the census, 
and uh, were encouraged to have more children so that they would not disappear. <laughs> and uh, anyway, there is a uh, uh, Standing Bear's work. Here he is in 1930 in his regalia as a leader of the community. And here are two of his daughters. The one on the far right is my grandmother, and the one on the far left is, is her sister. And you have got to believe that those Lakota genes must be really powerful because I don't see anything very Viennese about these <laughs> ladies, you know. <laughs> In fact, the one on the left that looks like her, her, looks like her father, she was a tomboy and she was a cowgirl. And she wore a split skirt, kind of like Barbara Stanwyck in, in a Big Valley, huh? And she had a whip, and she went out and she rounded up cattle. And uh, when she did marry, uh, each of the daughters had their own buggy and, uh, and their own horses and their own cattle. And, uh, and so she was very independent. Anyway, she was a horrible cook. <laughs> and she, 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 you always hated to go to Aunt Lily's house because you know you were going to be tortured, you know. <laughs> <because> <laughs> but here is my grandmother uh, who passed away in 1985, and it's from her that all of these stories came and the traditions of the household. Because even though it was a half-breed household, uh, it was Standing Bear's wish, and therefore the fa it became the family tradition to carry on all the traditions. The sacred traditions of the sun dance, the vision quest, the hunka ceremonies, the naming of children, uh, the burial rituals, the keeping of the spirit, those were all done by my family, despite the fact that they were, uh, that, their, uh, that Louise was a white woman. She totally embraced it. And in fact, they never joined any of the Christian denominations. And uh, their children did, but they did not. And so the, uh, uh, anyway, part of the way that he, part of the way that he contributed to the wealth of the household was through his painting on muslin. And here are examples of, of his uh, style of painting and he did scenes of buffalo hunts uh, and the iglaka, the, the camp moving, and the sun dance. And here is the totality of one of his painted muslins. It's like nine feet uh, and uh, nine feet by three. And there are other works of his. And for those of you who are not familiar with his work, uh, there, there, I want to inform you of uh, the work of Rodney G. Thomas, Rubbing Out of Long Hair, Pehinhaska Kosata, The Story of the Little Bighorn. That was published in 2009, and he extensively covers the work of Standing Bear in that, in that publication. Visions of the People, uh, a 1992 publication, features another big painted Muslim <laughs> by Standing Bear. And the uh, First American Art, the Charles and Valerie Diker Collection, uh, that was published in 2004. And uh, then the Sitting Bull uh, 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 catalog by Christian Feast features the, the painted muslin that's in the Karl May Museum in, in Radebeul, Germany. And, uh, and then, of course, the illustrations from the book Blackout Speaks are from a portfolio that Nyhart commissioned. And Louise insisted on being paid $300 and Nyhart thought that was outrageous, and she said, well, take it or leave it. Somebody else will buy it then. So he bought it, and that's what illustrates the, 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 the Black Elk Speaks volume. Plus, there is another portfolio, that which is housed at the uh, uh, Beagle Museum at, at Rosebud. Okay. In 1997, I received the Lila Wallace Arts International Fellowship. Uh, and I was to reside at the Claude Monet resident for four months and take advantage of Paris. And I thought, aha, this is, this is 
grandson going home. <laughs> because, first of all, my name is Amiot. My, 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 own, my father's people were, were French mixed bloods, but they arrived in the New World in 1637 in Montreal and Quebec. And I, I am the 13th generation of, of the Amiots who received a land grant from uh, one of the Charleses in, in Montreal. Anyway, uh, so it was a, a going home on two fronts. One was to go back and experience something uh, of, of what my great-grandfather had been through and these stories I had heard as a child. And so I packed up all of my collage materials, my historic photos and, and pieces of bits and pieces of brochures and newspaper articles, historic newspaper articles. I packed it all up and I looked at photos of my, of my great grandfather and, and all these people, you'll see them coming up here. And I said, okay guys, we're gonna go and replay history. And so I took them with me to Europe and proceeded to produce a series of collages celebrating uh, reminiscences of them in, uh, in, in Europe. So here, that's Col Claude Monet's residence. That's where I resided in a, in a place behind it that went over there every day to work. and Went down to the gardens. There were two other artists in residence and believe me, You'd never believe the things we did in Monet's garden. <laughs> we took our lunch and our wine and our beer and we'd go sit on the Japanese bridge and put our feet in the water and, 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 and drink wine and celebrate those lilies. <laughs> anyway, so this, uh, this shows Standing Bear. Money, <laughs> money is money is in Lakota is Mazaska. Well, his name is Monet, huh? <laughs> and among artists, there's a, a saying: "You're baroque if you don't have Monet." <laughs> <laughs> and and I adopted the vehicle, the old-fashioned car. And they certainly encountered that in, 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 in under the auspices of Buffalo Bill. You know, there are those wonderful photos of him driving the car and the Indians sitting in the back. Anyway, it became a symbol of the cultural changes that the Lakota people had to uh, <laughs> ride in order to survive. Technology, education, religion, uh, all those forces that Indian people were expected to adopt once they got on the reservation to change them into non-Indian people. Huh? And so the car that shows up in these drawings uh, symbolizes and, and the, the, the trip to Europe was one more of those things. We'll take them abroad and we'll expose them to what the world is really like and that'll be one more burden for them to bear and to adapt to. Huh? <laughs> going to make them civilized. Okay, and so here is another, this was the first collage I did in the, uh, in the uh, uh, series when I was there in 97. Children. 
the status of the water that existed at that time, you had better giving your children wine than let them drink Parisian water. <laughs> and then, then it, it says, uh, those women had deformed lower bodies. Anyway, the, uh, and this is how you <laughs> the, the, the bustle, you know, that you got. Anyway, they wondered what that was. Of course, when I was growing up, Louise meant, would, would explain that that was a fabrication. You know, it was made of whalebone, you know, it would make. And, but the, the Indians always wondered, why do those Washichu women want their butts to stick out, you know? <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> of course, there were those nasty old guys, too, said that, well, they probably consorted with horses. <laughs> And here, I don't know if I can take that up. No, that's OK. OK, this is the people in Paris. And this is, uh, this is from a poster from 1889. So that was the kind of boat that was going back and forth from England to Paris, huh, taking visitors to the Paris Exposition. And that would have been the type of boat that <laughs> one tradition that black elk <laughs> took across. Now the story we know from Pine Ridge is that he had an English girlfriend and he told her that I will go first and then I'll come after you next. But of course he didn't come after her. Then the other version is that he lived with a French family in Paris and that uh, when Buffalo Bill arrived then he rejoined and got his ticket back to the United States in, in 89. And uh, well, you know that story. Anyway, just recently I was talking to his great granddaughter and she said, Arthur, did you know that when I was born, uh, that was, she said, she said, old man Nick, Nicholas came over he told my dad, he said, who was Nicholas's grandson, I want you to name, name this baby Charlotte, because Charlotte was the name of my girlfriend when I lived in France. <laughs> <laughs> and so here we have Sandy, uh, Black Elk and his white girlfriend, Sandy. <coughs> and it says, this was that time he he left the, his girlfriend over there. And this says, uh, uh, <laughs> you know, Napoleon's tomb? Napoleon's tomb? Huh? It says in La, Co La Cosa that a man is buried here. His name is children of the French people would want to come up to them, run up and want to touch those Indians, huh? those little children. And those mothers would remind their children, those women said to their children, don't get close to those poor Louis, they are dangerous. They might steal you and take you away. Anyway, but the, here's a little girl, here's a little girl running up to the Indian ladies, wanting to touch them and feel them, you know. And anyway, this comes from the oral tradition. <laughs> And then there's the, uh, the visiting the various cities 
and some going in the background. This is a scene in Verno where the village next to me. Anyway, it says the, the backs of their houses were sometimes pitiful, you know. <laughs> the facades look nice, but you get into the alleys and you actually return to medieval <laughs> architecture. <laughs> and then it's not been written about, but one of the oral traditions uh, is that people were taken, were checked out of the Wild West show. Patrons are people that, and, and I, I mean, nobody has ever traced this down, but the Indian people talking about it, uh, being going, going with different people to their homes, like for overnight or two or three days, and they would take them by a carriage and then into the teens before 1913. Sometimes they went by automobile, but they also went by train and they would take them home for the weekend to their country estates. <laughs> and, and they would invite their friends over, huh? kind of like that, guess who's coming to dinner, you know? <laughs> and, and so the Indian people would sit there and eat off the, once again, who was talking about <laughs> uh, that TV show, Downton Abbey, <laughs> you know? Anyway, there were cases in, in Germany and France where people took Indian people home for the weekend. And they, uh, they were afraid to sleep on those really high beds because they might fall off and injure themselves, they said. And other times they felt that they were not very clean. And the little fireplaces in their rooms, they'd pull out loose bricks, you know, that were there. And they would put them in a basin and rearrange the furniture <laughs> and take the bedspread off, cover them up. You know how kids make forts, you know, with chairs and blankets. They'd make that themselves, uh, and they'd call in there and pour water out of it and have a sweat lodge. <laughs> 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 anyway, so I lived, I, I'd travel the countryside, and just imagine what my ancestors must have go been going through, you know, because the churches and the bridges and the landmarks hadn't changed that much, you know, in a hundred years. And I thought, well, I must be experiencing some of the things they experienced. <laughs> And then I'm going to rush here. But the idea, the title of this one was No One Was There. And this is a combination of scenes from Rouen and Verneau. Anyway, the, oh, one of the things that Indian people remarked about was the prevalence of flowers. They just were so impressed by the Europeans, uh, how, how much they love flowers. And there were flowers all over. Huh? Anyway, so I mentioned that in the, uh, but here they are in a village at midday, you know, <laughs> uh, from, from one o'clock until five or six, sometimes the whole village is closed down. And they were still doing this when I was there in 97. Uh, the, the, you, they're bare, nothing is there. You go drive through the countryside and these little villages are all closed up, you know, there's no people around. Well, I wasn't very good at learning the French language and uh, so I asked my French tutor, can you bring me some books on French anthropology, contemporary French life, so I could learn what these people are going through, what they're about, you know? So I had my contemporary French anthropology book and I was reading statistics. Anyway, it said, 95 of all French men have extramarital affairs and 75% of French women do. And I thought, aha. Uh -huh. And I just know when it happens, too. It's from <laughs> 1 o'clock till 5. <laughs> and then there's, uh, then there's Venice. And here I have put the, uh, the, this is a photo that I took. Over the years, I made it a mission to go to all the places where the Wild West show had performed so that I could see it as it now, and, but then I also gather historic photos <coughs> and, and timely things from, from the past. So here they are, you know, if you're familiar with this photograph, and it says, we went in those boats too. We really liked those boats. We brought lots of beads and shawls and flowers on them. We bought lots of beads and shawls and flowers on them. We sure liked those flowers on shawls. And then it says, uh, the whole 
town must have flooded. They still live there. <laughs> they go around in boats. And then it says, they sure like to see us. We went to every place and they looked at us. Here they are up here at the Georgia Tower or something. You go back over there and all those people standing down below looking up at them. And uh, And then home again. And uh, the, the infatuation with Queen Victoria. And uh, I, I will close here, but I want to just say that Black Elk, well, these old guys would sit around and they'd talk about Queen Victoria and how she rode out in this carriage and it was just shiny. It was so shiny. And all the people were shouting, Jubilee, Jubilee. And, and, and Black Elk or one of the other guys said, she was just glowing. She just looked delicious. <laughs> anyway, you have to understand, uh, uh, I mean, this wasn't an effort at cannibalism. <laughs> I mean, an expression of cannibalism. It had to do with the fact that the traditional foods of the people of the plains, the bison has very little fat. <laughs> And elk and deer have very little fat. And fat is a very precious commodity. I mean, it's highly prized, huh? And, uh, and uh, so they even break the bones open to get the marrow out in order to get the fat, huh? <laughs> and so when they say, saw Queen Victoria riding her carriage, just glistening, they were as much as saying, oh, she just looks like a delicious piece of fat. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Anyway, so then, so this is a, the, the other collages continue to uh, celebrate life on the reservation. People visiting from other reservations. My, grand, my grandmother and her two sisters in traditional garments. And here they are standing in front of an automobile. They're standing there in his wife. for the 50th reunion of the Battle of the Little Bighorn, and they rode around in automobiles at Hardin, Montana. And uh, anyway, so it's been a remarkable journey. And uh, I'm, I dare say the, the catalog that, I, that is for sale in the bookstore has the complete story. It's all written all about, more so than what I've told you today. <laughs> and there are more, more, uh, images of the collages. And uh, so talk about a hybrid life when you start hybridizing media, historical photos, paintings that you have done previously, paintings that your great grandfather did, and uh, 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 imagery. Oh, the flowers are, fo are photos of flowers that I took in France. And uh, anyway, it's bringing it all together. And I, that's what I think the Buffaloville Historical Center does. It brings together, and hopefully we'll, someday we'll have a really, really good picture of the widespread influence and the deep and indelible parts of the, of the legacy of Buffalo Bill. Thank you. I'll be down to bookstores signing any books that anyone may be interested in. <laughs>